Welcome to the Story Powers podcast, the show about the power of stories, the people who tell them, and why you should be doing it too. I'm your host, Francisco Mafus. My guest today is Dr. AJ Minai. AJ is a two times TEDx speaker, brand storyteller, and award winning entrepreneur who's spoken at over 200 events globally. He's also the chief memorability officer for Vision 77, which is AJ's and his partner Ryan's. Uh, ah, I forgot what he had said. He's also the chief memorability officer for Vision 77, which is how AJ and his partner Ryan will conquer the world and make it a better place. If you like the show, please subscribe and leave us an iTunes review. I need some hard evidence to show my wife this podcast isn't just an excuse to avoid changing the baby's diapers and taking out the trash. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. AJ Vinay. AJ, hey. welcome to the show. Thank you, Francisco. I am super excited. I, I, have, I have a lot of ad- admiration for anybody who's found a suitable excuse to avoid diapers and taking out the trash. <laughs> it, it's, one of, it's one of the better ones because the moment you lock the door, there is no opening it. Even the, <laughs> even the three-year-old knows that she cannot open the door when, rec- when dad is recording. So, <laughs> Yeah, well, well, you're a lucky man. That's all I'm going to say. You're a lucky, lucky man. <laughs> I, I might experiment with the Joe Rogan long form approach to podcasts when all of a sudden yeah. they're two and a half hours long. <laughs> okay. Okay, three and a half hours long. I'm gonna, I gotta make a few calls, buddy. <laughs> and, and, and my, my wife will probably say, "But hold on, you're recording for three hours, but the podcast, podcasts are still forty minutes long." Yeah, the editing. I get a lot of yeah. stuff gets cut out. <laughs> you know, you know how it is, honey. <laughs> so, AJ, I have a question to ask you that I, I'm, I don't think I, w- I ever thought I would ask anyone. I understand that Batman ruined your childhood. And you became a businessman because of Wolverine. Wow! Yeah, that that that's uh, you know, ugh, man, you gotta you you know, Francisco, you are I I love I don't I don't even I, I, I this is the first time I'm spending time with you, and we're live right now, and I have words escape me in terms of how much I love you for asking a question like that. Words escape me because I have to tell you, no one. And I repeat, no one has asked me that question before. And I'm so happy that I'm on the show here with you. And I'm so thankful that you invited me here, bro. Because that is, I can, just from that first question, I can tell that you are, you and I are going to have a lot of fun on this show. Trust me. We're, we're, right? we're, we're, we're nerds. We're nerds. <laughs> listen, listen, if you, if, you know, if you, if you check out the podcast, I mean, it's called the story powers podcast. And if you check I out know. the art, it's me with like a superhero thing behind me. And I I'm know. a drawing. It's not a that was so dope, man. I mean, and, and uh, I mean, you know, thank God, thank God we're, we're, you know, we're married and we have kids. Thank God. Because when we were single and we, we did this podcast, trust me, Nobody, you know, that would definitely drop our game if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh yes, yes. I, I don't have much game to drop, so you know, I waited for the marriage to be settled, for the children to be expensive before I could actually get all this, all this nerdiness out. <laughs> oh man, I mean, you know what? It's amazing, Francisco, how much of you and I have in common, even though it's the first time we're live together. I can't wait to get into this. But to answer your question, to answer your question, how Batman. I wouldn't say Batman ruined, ruined my childhood, but he definitely, he definitely played a very pivotal role in waking me up, right? He, he he definitely woke me up as a, as a, as a symbol and as our character. And I, and I don't want to get, I don't want to get too dorky for, for our audience sake, right? I want to stay more on the, on the brand storytelling side of things so that we don't lose half the crowd just in our ramblings on comic book characters. But hey, super, superheroes yeah. are, are very popular nowadays. I mean, we will lose less of a crowd than we would have 20 years ago. I know, I know completely. I completely agree with you. But the short answer is the fact that I grew up savagely, and and that's that's not an exaggeration, Francisco. I grew up savagely bullied, and I mean savagely. And there are a variety of reasons why I was bullied. And I'm not going to go into those reasons for the sake of time, but it was just it was just down to the fact that most of it was my fault. Right. Uh, most of it. And, and, and I'm not saying it from a point of regret. 
I regret nothing in my life except for one thing, which is what I said to my dad a long time ago. And uh, I spoke about that in my second TEDx talk. I, I said something to my dad when I was a kid uh, in my 20s. When I said when I said when I said a kid, I mean, uh, when I was in my 20s, I considered myself pretty immature in my in my early 20s still. You know, I said something to him that I regret. But let's answer your first question, which is the fact that Batman was someone that appealed to me as a child because I felt all the other heroes were were too far fetched. Uh, even as a child, I, I I I had that mindset as a child that I admired the fact that if you looked at the Justice League, you had Superman who was an alien, and you know Superman was invincible for all for for all intents and purposes, except for a green rock. Superman can't be beaten. Like literally, nothing touches him. Right. Um, then you had you know other characters. Each character in the Justice League had something over the top about them. The Flash, you know, moving at supersonic speeds or possibly even faster. Wonder Woman, a woman that's stronger than any man, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I mean, right? There were all characters that if you were a kid like me growing up, and I'm sure, Francisco, you identify with this, you know, I used to ask myself, could I ever, could I ever be any of these characters? And the, the answer would be no. You, you can't be, you can't be any of these characters. But as a child, you know, you still have a child's childish imagination. As you get older, one would hope that you retain your childlike behavior because that's very good. There's a huge difference between childlike and childish. I always encourage my participants and my audiences and, and my clients to remain childlike because it unlocks a level of creativity in you. But being childish is something that you grow out of. But of course, you're talking about when I was a kid, right? So being childish is what we do. And at, at that point in my own, in my own naive state, I felt that you could be Batman. I felt that, you know, someone could be Batman. And if, if you think about it, I mean, even afterwards, as I grew older, I started reading books. There was a book uh, out of, uh, out of a, a scientist in Harvard, if I'm not mistaken, that wrote a book called How to Become Batman, which I read I years later. I tried reading that book and it was so boring. So and, and listen, if for a book to be boring to me, but but halfway through he's just discussing basic biology. I was like, I don't need you to talk about mitochondria, right? Just get to the ninja stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's that's the reality though, Francisco. I mean, that's the reality of a hero. A hero has to go through a lot of I think a hero has to do a lot of things that, you know, when you picture when you picturize it and when you glamorize it. You don't you don't cover those parts of becoming a hero. The ingredients and 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 that's why I enjoyed the book later in my in my mid twenties, my late twenties when I read that book finally. I enjoyed the book because yes, it was boring, but it gave a very pragmatic, realistic approach of the sheer willpower, sheer sheer uh, training of mind, body, and soul and spirit for someone to actually even embrace the idea of being able to fight crime the way Batman does, right? But as a child. I saw Batman as the only realistic example of a hero out of out of all these other heroes. Even if I went to Marvel and I looked at Iron Man, I looked at all these other characters in Marvel, I would still feel like I don't associate with them. But for some reason it clicked with Batman. And then unfortunately, you know, in my childish pursuits of Batman, I became fairly obsessed with the character and I, you know, I, I used to dress up as him every Halloween. I, I'm not joking, Francisco. Every Halloween I had a new Batman suit and I was trying to put it on. And because I grew up savagely bullied uh, for a variety of reasons that I won't go into, but long story short, it was very difficult to connect myself to that character because I felt like I was a loser for the longest time. But I'm proud to say that nobody's a no one. I'm proud to say that now. I'm proud to say that I spent a long portion of my life, including my formative years as a child, making this huge mistake, which is... I thought I needed to fit in in order to be better, but I, I failed to understand that the whole point of life is standing out. It, it, it's not about fitting in. It's about embracing your differences and how different and diverse you are from the next person. And that the, the biggest truth that I uncovered at the end of that journey towards even up to my late 20s, actually, to be transparent, friends, even up to my late 20s, the journey that I uncovered is that no one is you and that is your biggest power. No one is you, and that is your that's your definition of your own power. So Batman, I would say, challenged me, challenged me to face demons that I was running away from for a very long time. And the reasons why I was bullied wasn't because 
they were wrong. Yeah, what they did to me was wrong. I, you know, I'm talking just to give you an idea. Uh, I'm talking about things like getting urinated on on a football field. I'm, that's what I mean by savage. So I'm just giving you an idea of how bad it was. That's where I came from. And years later, I look back now and I realize something that just like Batman, just like any other hero who is vulnerable, you know, heroism or heroics don't come from invulnerability. That's why I could never identify with Superman because he is invulnerable. But Batman always appealed to me because it was a, it was a basis for me to understand eventually. I didn't understand it when I was a kid. I went through a lot of hard times, but eventually I understood that true warriors aren't invincible. They're actually very fallible. They're very, they're very, very delicate. They're very fragile. And that's okay. It's, it's in the fragility of our lives that we actually, we move that inch by inch growth every day and we become heroes. And the only hero that you need to look for in your life is in the mirror. You know, follow, you know, you learn from everyone, but you follow no one. And that, that's, that's, that's the culmination of what Batman meant to me. I'm sorry if it was long winded, Francisco, but that was Batman. Listen, it's Batman. I'll, I'll forgive. I'll forgive Batman many things. Well, apart from maybe having become Ben Affleck, but you know, <laughs> I think it, I think that one is. I think that one is out of his hands. Um, yeah. So, so as you said, you know, what, one of the things, one of the things we wanted to to talk about, and when I reached out to you, was specifically because I wanted to talk about about brand storytelling. But, but the one thing I wanted to ask you before, because storytelling has become a buzzword. And one thing I do come across a lot, not only on social media, but everywhere is everybody loves tagging on the term storyteller or storytelling to stuff they do. So what I wanted to ask you was, what exactly is brand storytelling and what isn't? Right. That's a, that's a brilliant question. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer part of the last question in this question as well with when you mentioned Wolverine, I'm going to bring that into the answer here. But from a, from a technical perspective, Let's go into the technicalities. Sure. Brand storytelling is the ability for people to understand one statement from a more scientific point of view. People have become brands and brands have become people, right? So brand storytelling today in this age of digital, in this age of disruption, in this age of having to stand out in an ocean of, of saturated industries, saturated campaigns saturated ideas because we live in an age where we all understand that there's no such thing as an original idea in in reality there's no there's no such thing as an original idea everything is kind of a build up from another idea now and that's thanks to social media thanks to the world that we live in that we like to call globalized but thanks to covid-19 is now becoming very quickly hyper localized we realize that now more than ever storytelling whether it's for a personal brand or it's for a corporate brand storytelling will be the key to unlocking a variety of different levels for your business when and when i say business i mean i've always kept that mentality in my life at least till from my mid 20s onwards right as an entrepreneur and somebody working in corporate for companies large and small around the world and then finally becoming an entrepreneur that i am today i've always believed that The word brand doesn't apply to just businesses. I believe Francesco Mafuz is a brand. I believe that Dr. AJ Minai is a brand. And it's not about, when I say brand, I don't mean it from a glam point of view. I don't mean it from a, from a dibs vanity point of view. I mean from a, from a discipline of building your level of excellence in life point of view. That if you were to carry yourself at all times with this self-awareness that I am a brand, then you will do everything with an extra mile in it because just like you want to interact with any other brand whether it's whether it's a food delivery service that serves you well whether it's going to the cinema and seeing someone who attended to you really well whether it's you know getting on the phone and booking a flight or going somewhere or booking a hotel reservation and you realize that wow that was an experience that really stood out in my mind again There are so many hotels that we're going to stay at in our lifetime. There's so many vacations we'll take. There's so many people that we'll meet. How does one stand out? How can you leave people and brands and things in your life better than how you found them? And I think that is through brand storytelling. That's what I call brand storytelling. 
brand storytelling is the ability to create impact in your words and your actions. And that is why I've, I've positioned myself as a chief memorability officer, because in my mind, storytelling is the key to unlocking how a brand or a personal brand even becomes memorable. And that is the equivalent of standing out out of thousands of different, you know, people standing next to you or companies who are your competitors. So what brand storytelling is, is an expression of the essence of your, your core, but simplified, simplified in a way that people remember it. So it has to be a story. And of course, we're not, we're not going to, we're not going to make this into a saintly movement. Brand storytelling is also a revenue technique. I mean, we shouldn't, we shouldn't downplay that aspect. One thing that I find very interesting about a lot of the storytellers that I've come across is that there are two very clear segments of storytellers in the world. There are the storytellers that have played storytelling to the point where it's become very salesy. They're using it purely from a marketing funnel point of view, and they've become overwhelmingly obsessed with how I can use stories. Unfortunately, I don't mean to be crude, but how I can use stories to to falsify or dupe people into believing that my product and service is the way to go, right? And I and I say that I say that that's one one school of thought that they believe that you can use storytelling as a new spin instead of using sales as you used to in yesteryear. You no longer sell, but you make them buy. That's one camp, and then there's another camp that goes exact the exact opposite, which is very altruistic, that believes that storytelling is something of a, a sacred movement. It's a sacred thing that it has, it comes from wisdom. It comes from spirituality. It comes with mysticism that stories of old were told. And that's how generations carry that torch, which, which don't get me wrong. They also hold their own, they hold their own rights. They have their own perceptions that are correct in their own ways. I'm not negating either side, but I am saying that there are two very clear demarcations, the two different camps. And I feel like at times, there are very few people in the middle. I, I, I de- identify myself as being in the middle because I think you need to strike a balance. You need to strike a balance where you are authentic as a storyteller. You are authentic as a storyteller, which means that you are not creating narrative for a company that will illicitly misrepresent the company. At the same time, I also recognize that brand storytelling has to be a means for you to be able to draw people towards your revenue funnels. It has to recognize that there needs to be a CTA in the story or a call to action that we call it. And that's, that's, that's what I feel it is. I feel, I feel that the embodiment of a, of a brand storyteller or a business storyteller in today's time isn't just a buzzword that you put up on a post, hashtag storyteller. I believe that you need to go through an actual process. And which is why we have tools like the SMC, the storytelling model canvas. It's not just, it's not just like I wake up one morning and I decide to be a storyteller. It's not like that. There, there are, there's years of, of hard work that goes into understanding what are the different dynamics of storytelling that can help company A and what are the different dynamics that will help company B. And if, if, if Francesco came, came, comes to AJ and says, AJ, I want to build a personal brand. What is Francesco's essence that, that, that we can then take storytelling techniques into his essence and we can build a brand that truly is legacy and not just currency. And you need to merge them. You need to merge them because you want to build a legacy, but you can't deny the fact that you do need currency as well. So you need to know how to choose it. That's, that's how I, have I feel. A, I have a feeling, I have a feeling it's not the first time you ever use the legacy and not currency line. <laughs> No, actually, that's a I, very, I, I, that, had that, that has a very good sound to it. <laughs> I, I, be, I often tell, uh, Francisco, I, I often tell people not to chase currency, but to chase legacy. I, I, feel, I feel like that's my calling in life. I, I've always been very focused on building that impact into whatever I do, as opposed to looking at the dollar signs behind it. But at the same time, I think a storyteller has to understand if you if you call yourself a storyteller, a professional storyteller, if you say that you're out there servicing your clients, then you need to understand that a storyteller cannot be an opinionated personality. A storyteller, much like a counselor, much like a psychiatrist, much like a psychologist, much like a coach, has to detach themselves away with away from 
their own life opinions with with immersing themselves into that that person's story. So when I, if, if I come to Francisco's, let's just say territory, or I come into his turf, my takeaway and my impact won't come from sharing stories about AJ to Francisco. No, my impact and my takeaway will be enhanced and be, will be felt by Francisco when I give him the space to tell me his stories. That's the role of a true storyteller, not just telling your own stories, but being able to, to celebrate and add value to other people's stories. And that's the There's, difference between fake and real storytelling. There is this, it's not a story so much, it's more of a, a little anecdote that a lot of people love talking about, that some famous sculptor was asked, you know, you got this block of concrete, how do you know what to sculpt? And he says, well, I just chip away everything that is not the sculpture. And then to some extent, I find that the process of trying to, both when I'm telling my own stories and I'm helping someone else to find their story is, you know, you have this experience or this quality you're trying to express, and then you just have to chip away at everything they give you that is not the story. So, you know, what is, what is the experience where you've learned this? Where is the experience where this has become important to you? What is the experience that exemplifies, or, or maybe that doesn't exemplify? What is the experience where you did the complete opposite that you're that you're trying to do or show that you value now get everything else that is not that out of it and typically you end up with if not the story well, at least with the with the essence of what a story can be absolutely absolutely i mean what you described is what i call diamond in the rough from you know when i was a kid i loved aladdin and there was this terminology in aladdin was called uh, diamond in the rough which means basically that in inside inside a, a very unpolished looking rock you can always find something that's immeasurably valuable like a diamond right and that you need to you need to chip away you need to really chip away on on those aspects in your own life where not only uncover your own milestones for you to empower yourself but also develop the science that you just mentioned or what maybe perhaps not the science but the technique that you just mentioned that the ability to chip away when people tell you their whole tapestry, you can look at their tapestry and go, okay, this is sand, 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 sand. There's the diamond. Let's dig a bit deeper. Let's dig a bit deeper. That's a diamond. That's a diamond. That's a diamond. And you piece that together. And then you have truly a beautiful combination of sand and diamond sparkling together. You know what I mean? So I, I, I completely I, agree. I do. And I am, I am, I'm aware that, and without wanting to go into another comic book digression, but you haven't talked about Wolverine. You said you would, and you would tie it to the brand storytelling, but you have not talked about Wolverine. <laughs> I, I will, I will. I was gonna, I was gonna bring it up. I was gonna bring it up, but then I got so carried away by by what we just spoke about. You can about bring it back later about... if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean Wolverine. Wolverine basically was my first. I'd say, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of Money Heist. I'm, I'm sure people listening have watched Money Heist on Netflix, right? I'm a huge fan. So um, Wolverine was my it's high huge first time. Huge in Spain, time. right? Huge, huge, <laughs> in, huge in Spain. Massive, right? It's, I mean, I, mean, yeah. I, mean you, I, can't, I can't blame people. I mean, Money Heist is dope. I mean, seriously dope. I loved it, right? And, you know, I, I think a Wolverine was my first, was my first Money Heist. <laughs> I, I think he was my first... Heist, you know, because I, I, I used to, as, as a, for some reason, as a kid, I used to love selling stuff. I used to love, like, I, I guess, I guess because I had, I mean, everybody around me told me, dude, you can sell ice to an Eskimo, AJ, right? That's, that's, that's what, that's the narrative that I heard around me that, you know, you've got a mouth on you. So, and then, <laughs> and then I decided to use that mouth to, <laughs> to 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 drive a bit of gain for myself and i'm ashamed of saying this i'm ashamed of saying this because this is something that i don't like to and i don't like to admit because francisco you're 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 somebody who's fairly well known as as with story powers and everything that's happening bro so i'm scared that if i admit this it's gonna be it's gonna be a crime admitted in the past right? is, is this not but, this is this not the story you told in a tedx talk i did, I, I, not, did, I, did. I, I haven't gotten a detective on you i, I, I went uh, online and found it <laughs> you're not hiding I it know. very well aj i know i'm not i'm not hiding it very well i i I actually kind of, I actually kind of forgot that I talked about it on TEDx. Did I really talk about that? Yep. Oh man, uh, <laughs> I really shouldn't have talked about that. Anyways, long <laughs> shit. Okay. Anyways, long story short, 
I used to love uh, collecting Marvel trading cards. And you know what I'm talking about, Francisco. I'm yep. sure like you come from that yes. generation. With yes, me. I know. <laughs> and uh, you know what I did was I used to flip them from a from an entrepreneurial perspective. I flipped them. So this was this was my first foray into entrepreneurship as a kid. You know, I can't remember how old I was, nine or ten or seven or eight, somewhere around there. I was a young kid. I was like ten or or eleven, something like that. And I remember I was going to. I used to go and play at a field uh, near my house, and you know we used to play around soccer most of the time malaysia crazy about soccer you know big thing blah 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 and um turns out there was a kid who went to my school but he was much older than me much bigger than i was he was from argentina i'm i'm sure if he listens to this he's probably going to kill me uh name was matthias <laughs> you know he was huge he was i mean for a kid who was about 10 or 11 when i see when i say huge he was my he was my size now but he was huge to me and, uh, uh, you know, he, he wanted, he saw this Wolverine hologram that I had, Francisco, and, um, we, we, we got talking and basically long story short, for the sake of time on the podcast, I sold him the card for at least about 60 to 70% profit. So I remember I bought the card for about 40, 40 ringgit, 40 Malaysian ringgit. And I think I sold it to him for something like 200 ringgit. I can't remember the exact pricing, but it was like, it was like, it was, it was a, it was a jump, right? It's 60, 70% jump on it. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a huge jump. I sold it to him. And uh next thing I know, he comes banging on my gate saying, you know, dude, you fleeced me. You know, I'm obviously being very diplomatic. I'm not telling I'm not telling you exactly what he said, but it was much worse than that, right? I was a kid. I was like 9 or 10 or something. So when he was at my gate like threatening me, what I did, I did what any any kid my age would do. I called mom, right? And she solved my problems. And, uh, you know, when, when Matthias was explaining and he was like telling, you know, you saying, you know, auntie, your son, he, he did this, he did this, he sold me this, he misrepresented, he did that, blah, 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 all that stuff that he was talking about. This guy was 17 years old, you know, so he could, he could explain himself. I remember standing at the gate, hiding behind my door while my mom was talking to him. I can still remember that. And, uh, you know, then my mom turns around and she, she says to me, like, do you, did you do this? And I was, did you, did you take this money? You know, and I was like, no, I just have to, I lied. <laughs> no. And, and I swear, I, I swear, Francisco, the money was in my pocket when I said no, <laughs> the money was in my pocket. I, and it was like, I was, I was using that money. I was flipping the money and that's what I did. I was using, I, I did this. I, I used the money that I was flipping for my cards and I used to be the kid in school, even though I was being bullied and I was being ravaged in several ways because I was smaller, scrawnier, stammering. I used to stammer a lot and all that stuff that was going on in my life when I was a kid. Even then, I had the most money in the class. I mean, everybody else was getting pocket money for like, you know, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, 30 bucks. I used to walk around with like 200 bucks in my <laughs> so what you're saying, my What you're saying is that your empire started with a crime. Well, if you put it that way, I mean, you know, nobody's perfect. <laughs> nobody's perfect. Well, I, I, listen, I'll give you, I'll give you a short and worse story that will make you feel better. When, when I was a kid, my brother and my cousins were all liked comic books. So everybody used to say that they were a particular superhero, but only one of us could be one superhero. So my brother, I think, was always Thor. And then I don't know who I was, Spider Man or something. And one of my cousins got Wolverine. And I was like, oh, I really wanted Wolverine, but he called it first, right? So, well, what can you do? And then Days of Future Past came out. And at the end of Days of Future Past, Wolverine gets killed by a sentinel. So I showed him the comic book and said, ah, he's dead. You have to pick someone else. And then he picked someone else. And I said, ah, he's not dead. I'm Wolverine now. Suck it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so that's the true crime. You duped your cousin. That's the true crime. Oh, yeah. So, so everybody... Everybody listening to this, remember, shift your focus away with what AJ did when he was young with the flipping of, of money <laughs> and bring it to what Francesco just talked about of how he betrayed his own family. That's, that's what you need to remember. <laughs> So that so that none of you remember the rest. <laughs> <laughs> right. So back back to back to storytelling and branding and all this stuff. And this is something I have very little experience with, which is the because traditional storytelling or storytelling more in a sales context and a leadership context, maybe even in an advertising context, if you're generally doing ads, sure, I, I understand all that. 
but digital storytelling, particularly in, in, in situations where you're not actually using that many words. So what would you say are you know what the main techniques that still apply? And if a company is doing something and they're not going to tell a story in the, in the specific sense of the word, how, do, how is that done well? Okay. That's a great question, man. That's a great question. So, you know, digital storytelling actually is, is simply using different elements beyond text to communicate the story. That's what, I mean, I'm simplifying it for you. It's a lot more than that, but I'm simplifying it in terms of digital storytelling is essentially being able to use modern digital techniques <clears throat> and expressions. For example, GIFs, you know, GIFs, memes, you know, what limited content copy when you're posting on Twitter or limited content copy when you're posting on Instagram, there's a character count copy. So you need to know how to use limited textual representation to, to express a story. And that too, it's never just as easy as expressing the story. Any Tom, Dick and Harry, with all due respect, any Tom, Dick and Harry can do that. But the, the key is, can you do it digitally in a manner that touches people? Right. I mean, because at the end of the day, the reason why digital storytelling is something so important for businesses is because it is the it is the precursor or it is the gateway for businesses to become something that people feel and not just something that people think about. Right. Let me repeat that for for the audience and for the for the listeners. You know, the whole point of brands today and businesses. And again, when I say brands, I don't mean just companies, but but even people with their own personal brand. I mean, the whole point of this whole aspect of storytelling is around the aspect that you you need to create an emotiveness, for lack of better words, an emotiveness, an emotional aspect of connection that stories often do, almost always, that leads to memorability. But why do you do it? Why, why do you want to be memorable? If you really think about it, you want to be memorable because you made something, someone or something felt, you know, you, you made something feel about your brand. And that's really important. And I, I can give a, I can give a very simple example. The Avengers recently with the end game. Let's just say, imagine, imagine Francisco, we're, we're 20 years in the future, right? We're some, somewhere in like, you know, maybe 2040, right? Imagine you and I have this conversation and I talk about a movie that came out 20, 25 years, you know, earlier, Avengers end game. Now you and I, it's been 20 years plus, you know, we don't. Now, if I say, so tell me the name of the actor who played, you know, Thanos, you're going to be like, I don't really remember, dude. I don't, I don't remember. You know, I remember the Josh, movie. Josh Brolin. Dude, it's 2020 still. <laughs> I, right? I, I would, I would remember, man. <laughs> really? Oh, bad dude. I'm sorry, bad, but you're a bigger dork than I am. Then. <laughs> no, I, just kidding. I, the but, moment you said that movie, all, all I would do is this. That's all. That's all you remember. <laughs> but, but you see, okay, that, that actually, oh my God, that was in a, that was a beautiful point. You just reinforced the point that I was just about to make. You see, people will forget the actors. They won't remember all the actors' names. They'll even forget the name of the movie after 20, 20 10, 15 years, right? I mean, when I look about Jurassic Park 2, I don't remember the name of the Jurassic Park 2 movie. You know, I don't remember the name they put the tagline. I don't remember it. You see what I mean? So my point is, you know, even Matrix, Matrix 1 and then Matrix 2, it'll take me some time to remember, oh, yeah. Matrix 2 was reloaded or was it Revolutions? I can't remember. You see what I mean? Now, at that time when Matrix came out, it was all the bomb. It was all the buzz. People would know it like the back of their hands. The Matrix back in the day was the equivalent of the Avengers in this day and age in terms of the hype, in terms of the cult movement at that point, right? And now what I'm, what I'm getting at is people will forget all of that. But if, if you zoom in, Within that conversation, very quickly past what's the name of the movie what was this, and people say no, 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 and then you just go, you know, you remember that part when Captain America was on the ground and when he got up and he was tightening his brace. Remember how the circles opened up behind him, and then you don't even need to finish the rest of the story. You know what people do? They're like, yeah, yeah, and then all the Avengers come back to life and they all come back and they all fight Thanos and you know all of it comes out. You see, now there's something really interesting about that. Why is it that people can forget the actors years after the names of the characters, the storyline, even in totality, they can't remember everything, but they'll remember one moment or two, three moments in that movie. Why? Because it made them feel something. That's the, that's the science behind storytelling. It, they felt something in that moment. In that moment, you as an, 
as a, a viewer of the movie in the cinema, you, you connected with the characters in a way you connected with Chris Evans character, Captain America. At that point, you were like, wow, that's now that's, that's amazing. That's, that's that feeling that euphoria that you get. That's what brands and personal brands, even corporate brands and personal brands are now trying to replicate through storytelling, through digital storytelling. And you can do that in a variety of different ways. You can do that through GIFs, right? It's a simple, a simple flash in, flash out of three, four images that are just looping that can drive home a certain point. For example, unfortunately, I, you know, I'm, I, I, I hate to use this example because it's a very, it's a very, very, it's a very sad situation that's taking place with the whole George Floyd situation around the world, around Black Lives Matter. And it's something that's very close to my heart because it has been going on for too long now in the world. Racism should have gone extinct. It's, 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 it's what happened to George Floyd should happen to no one ever, anywhere in the world, irrespective of the color of their skin. And right now, unfortunately, the battle that African Americans are fighting is a battle that should have been won decades ago. It shouldn't have have existed for this long. You know what I mean? But to just give you an example, there have been several GIFs and, and, and uh, you know, memes and all sorts of different sort of things that have been popping up on our WhatsApps, right? And our Telegrams and all this stuff. And if you see some of these GIFs, they actually showcase a story just in three, four, just in three, four loops. I mean, the GIF is only for four seconds long, five seconds long, but it tells a little story, right? Another example is limited text copy. I was once approached by a memorial house, a funeral service, and their owner had passed away. The father had passed away and the son was taking over in the business. And the son asked me in the middle of our conversation, you know, what's something that I should put on my, on my father? As a as a as something that actually brings people to understand that this man had saved and helped thousands of people, even when they couldn't afford coffins, when they couldn't afford uh, a burial ground, he was there to help them. I want to embody that. I want to put something nice on his on his on his stand there. And I said, "What if you just put the soul that tried, the soul that tried?" Four words. Now, when you when I when you hear that, Francisco, it it makes you feel something. I mean, imagine you walk past someone's grave and you, you looked at their name and you looked at the, 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 you know, the years that they lived. And then you just see these four words, the soul that tried and the story builds up in your mind on its own, even if it's not the real story, but it, it definitely, it creates a landscape in your mind. And you start to imagine what type of man or woman would have this person been for them to have such a beautiful eulogy, but it's just a short four word eulogy. And it leaves so much to the imagination, but it takes you to a positive place. It takes you to a good place. So digital storytelling is the ability to understand modern digital techniques and disruptive funnels, disruptive technologies, disruptive little nicks and knacks that we have, how to use platforms disruptively from TikTok to Snapchat to LinkedIn. How do you use these mediums and their limitations and turn those limitations into something that become impactful in the story itself that you're delivering? So for me, that's what digital storytelling is. It's, it's the ability to be able to have a digital backbone, but to understand the emotive storytelling techniques on top of that backbone and playing and celebrating with their weaknesses and their strengths on each platform accordingly. You gave a very beautiful example of what someone could put on on their grave. And I remember that I used to work with a guy and the joke in the office is that when he passed, his grave would say, he did everything wrong. <laughs> okay. All right. You guys are just mean now. <laughs> But but I like, Come on, I, 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 I like I, see listen this is this is a theme now it's becoming a theme in my in my show i i tell the guests often you bring the wisdom i'll bring the nonsense <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, but it's no, cool but something i want to pick up on something you said about the 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 very minimal elements you need for a story and this is something i heard i believe from park howell who has a podcast called the business of story yeah. And he talks about the caveman story. I don't know if you heard this one. <laughs> yes, so, the, so this is the yeah the caveman story. Is for the audience, it's it's just three parts, as most stories are, and it's oh 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 ah. <laughs> it's great. And that's genius. That's genius. It is genius. I mean, again, I love storytelling. 
it isn't it isn't a profession for me and it's not a profession for you it's who you are a storyteller isn't i mean don't get me wrong francisco i'm not saying i'm not saying that it's and what i'm what i'm saying at this moment isn't an excuse for everybody to get off their bed and go i'm a storyteller no that's not what i'm saying i'm not saying it's an excuse for that i'm saying that there are some people that innately love stories they innately love it they 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 enjoy it whether it's in the middle of a zoom call for a very important business meeting or whether it's just in a grocery store in the waiting line on the cashier but you know where there are just some people who truly love to listen to stories because that's how they learn there there are different type of learners in the world they're auditory learners they're kinesthetic learners they're also to different learners and i believe a type of learner is the learner that that you know really enjoys listening to other people's experiences and their adventures their stories per se and then that becomes a part of them that's part of their wisdom right and that's really beautiful because even steve jobs said that that's why if you noticed on my linkedin profile francisco my my the very first the very first excerpt is from steve jobs about how the storyteller will dictate and decree the entire generation to come and steve jobs lived that life he created a story of apple he created that and then he lived it he created that story of apple in his mind i'm sure of it people think that people probably think that steve just kind of just went with the flow i don't think so i think i think he sat down and he visualized it in his younger days before he passed of course i i i'm sure he he visualized it in his mind that you know i would i would carve something into history that would become of legend and apple is definitely a business i mean irrespective of how they're doing now irrespective of their stock market prices irrespective of all that stuff that's going on and everything that has happened and everything that will happen but it's undeniable that steve jobs is synonymous with apple just like richard branson is synonymous with virgin and just like tony fernandez is synonymous with air asia you know this is something that people need to learn people have become brands and brands have become people so it's really important that you humanize your business because if you humanize it people will trust your business as well behind you you win half the battle you no longer need to sell you actually make them buy so that element of the camp i you know the the two camps i told you about earlier francisco yeah. you need to take from both of them there's nothing wrong with both of them you just need to learn how to to balance them so that the scale is balanced you can't become capitalistic but you can't become super altruistic you know you've got to be a saint but you've got to be a sinner and and storytelling is in the middle of that and so you can balance your skills it's a very it's a very human process francisco it's very human it it's meant to be human and that's why i think storytelling is so powerful because it's human it's so much more human than a corporate memo it's so much more human than a set of slides it's so much more human than anything else that will touch you it's just a story where you sit down and talk and just like the story you just told me you did every he did everything wrong i mean that's that's a story <laughs> the story in itself i mean in my mind you have no idea the story that's running in my mind now because of that i'm thinking what did he do wrong what did he do wrong did he kill? everything did he, wrong? he did everything <laughs> wrong aj but listen there's there's something I, i'm i'm glad you you're obviously so passionate about about branding and storytelling and personal branding because i i realize once this episode is out um, and it's on LinkedIn, you might have some your work cut out for you because this episode might have complicated your personal brand because your LinkedIn profile is like super serious. It's Dr. AJ Minai. And you've got a, like a, a good blue steel face going on and you're wearing a suit and I've seen some of your videos. You're kind of always more on the serious side. And and I I thought that there was something wrong there when I found out that your company, one of your companies, Subture, referred to you as the silver surfing goofball. I was like, hold on. Hold on, the silver surfing. I mean, this is a pretty obscure reference here, right? So someone who listened to this and go, "Wow, this is not the Doctor AJ that I imagine." <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry, dude. And you know what? You're the first. You're the. You're not the first one who said this. So this is this is this is the first, not first on this show. <laughs> so you you're 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 not the first. You're not the first person who's actually had a conversation with me and raised this up like dude i don't get it the the guy i see on linkedin is this super suited suited booted sort of dude and then i see this dude 
And you're like, dude, you're the opposite of what I see on LinkedIn. And, and I only have one thing to say to that, Francisco. You know, the best movies are the ones that have the best plot twists. Fair right? enough. <laughs> I, I always say that. You know, the best stories are the ones that have the most twists. And you and I are the biggest fans of anything that's on Netflix, including Money Heist, because of the twists, right? So I'm just going to say that if you are truly a storyteller, you will build your own stories twists. And that's what I'm doing. You know, I love a bit of mystery. And I think it's a good mystery to have when people see one side of you and then they see all of a sudden another side of you and then they see another side of you because they keep on seeing different sides of you and they don't know what to expect next. I think that's magical. I think that's how a brand should be. So anyways, that's my that's my opinion, bro. I mean, that's just me. Uh, and, and, I, and I fully agree with you. Having been on my my second marriage now, I would tell you just now, the twists and turns don't work so well in your marriage. Your wife wants to know what to expect when you come out of the blue with something completely unexpected that doesn't tend to make the story more exciting. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you know, you know, I got to tell you, Francisco, this, this episode may not just be so dangerous for me. I think this episode might be dangerous for you if, <laughs> if your if your wife or perhaps your, your ex wife listens to this episode. Well, she's, she's, she's been she's been she's been, the, the current the current Mrs. Francisco Mafus uh, has been with me for long enough that that she I don't think she even listens to me anymore. Right? She just sees my mouth moving and go ah uh, yeah well. <laughs> but anyway, no, but you know I mean, uh, it, storytellers. What are you going to do? Yeah, they never yes. shut up. That's us. Yeah. Uh, AJ, where can, where can people find you? So I'm in the process of launching ajminai.com. And if everything goes really well, then probably by next week sometime, you'll be, you'll be, and, and everybody else on LinkedIn will be seeing the launch of ajminai.com. And I'd like to say that, you know, you should check that out when it happens. But in the meantime, like I've always been saying on all my other different interviews and podcasts that I've been doing in the past, even in my own posts, I mentioned that LinkedIn is my, my heart and soul. I mean, I mean it in a, in a, both in an emotional and a non-emotional way. LinkedIn has been a great opportunity for me to build revenue as well. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I, I don't want to lie because I believe part of being a storyteller is being authentic about what you say and you, what you, you do. You, you left the lying back in your Wolverine days. <laughs> I wish I was recording the video of this. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not. Uh, I, I I have no comments on this uh, on this statement. <laughs> no, but 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 yeah. So everything except for the everything for except for the Wolverine times of my life, where I was I was strongly an advocate of authentic storytelling, right? And, uh, and that being said, jokes aside, that being said, also from an emotional point of view. I believe that LinkedIn is one of the very last remaining organically geared platforms. I mean, if you think about Instagram, you think about Facebook, you think about other platforms, again, no offense to those platforms. They obviously have a huge, huge advantage when it comes to the volume of users compared to LinkedIn. But I still believe that when it comes to organic brand building or storytelling, you know, it pays off the most on LinkedIn. It really does right now. I, I feel like that. Maybe I'm biased. But that's my opinion. It's one of the most organic platforms out there still that allows you to grow without having to dip your hands deep into your own pockets for your own companies and for your own personal brand. So LinkedIn is the answer. Look out for me on LinkedIn. Find me on LinkedIn. I'm most active there. In fact, that's where I met Francisco, this legend of a man here. So yeah, oh, I definitely. Think, I think by the time by the time the episode comes out, your website will most likely be live. So I'll, I'll link it on the show notes. And uh Thank you very much for your time, sir. This has been this has been That's a great cool. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank you for exposing me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think you might be one of the last people that I interview that won't know what hit them. Uh, I will end up getting a getting a reputation for this, but you know, I do you my research. You should have told me. You should have told me, man. <laughs> you put it out there. It's on the TEDx. You're not hiding it. Don't don't complain. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for thanks for show. tuning in. Take care of yourselves. And until next time. Bye, guys. Bye.